bring to you, sisters and brothers, grace and peace of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus, be with all of you. I'd like to welcome you to worship here at Trinity United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Mark O'Neill, and it is a pleasure to have you with us on this 31st day of January, 2021, or what the church calendar tells us is the fourth Sunday after the Epiphany. As far as our announcements are concerned, I just want to remind everyone that we are continuing on with our James Devotion Series uh, Monday through Saturday at 10 a.m. right here on our church Facebook page. You can join us. Well, we will read a couple of verses from James. We'll talk about it. And we'll pray together. We'll have a response uh, possibility or suggestion. We'll receive words of grace. Um, it's been a, a good time. I know that I've enjoyed leading it so far. Um, if you can't make 10 o'clock, then just know that every session is always going to be saved, be saved right here uh, on our Facebook page. Also saved over on my YouTube channel. Uh, so be sure to check us out. If you can't find it, let me know, and I'd be more than happy to, to try and help you out. Uh, one other thing I wanted to, to bring to your attention is that um, as we're going through this uh, virtual worship service together, if there is a prayer request, a prayer need, uh, something on your mind, a joy you want to share, then take advantage of the comment function here on Facebook. Uh, type it in, tell us what it is, and I'll be sure to come back through after worship and gather everything and then pray accordingly during the course of the week, uh, depending upon what is what is listed there. So those are the announcements for this Sunday. I want to, as we look to begin our worship service together, invite you to join me as we go to the Lord in prayer together. Let us pray. Loving God, whose touch can heal the broken places of life, touch us today. God of peace, whose spirit of peace can quiet our spirits of confusion and despair, reassure us today. Forgiving God, whose call to repentance promises grace upon grace, place your mercy in our souls today. You who heal the sick and liberate the imprisoned, who bring justice in the midst of oppression, and strength in the midst of weakness. Pour out your spirit of power upon us today. Open our hearts to new faithfulness. Redirect our waywardness and hold us gently in your goodness. We confess our need to you. And we turn to you with hearts filled with hope. Remembering the promises you have made to us. May your name be glorified in us and through us. We ask it through Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son, He who is our Lord and our Savior, our brother, and our friend. Amen.
send our calls to worship out uh, via email if I have your email address. I also post them every week right here on our Facebook page. And the goal is that if you are joining us virtually that you're able to access it and be able to join in the call and response call to worship that we are used to. If whatever reason you don't have it, couldn't find it, didn't get it, well that certainly is fine. And I instead uh, invite you to, to adopt a posture of prayer as we go through our call to worship together. Come to worship this day. Bring with you all your joys and sorrows. Jesus will offer hope. Come to worship this day, believing in the power of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus will bring healing. Come to worship this day, feeling the presence 
of God. Jesus will teach us new ways to live. Amen. Well, sisters and brothers, we come now to our first reading of Scripture for this morning. And as we await with joyous anticipation what the Lord would have revealed to us through his written word, I want to invite you to join me as we say together our prayer for illumination. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our first reading this morning takes us to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. We're in the 18th chapter, and we'll be reading verses 15 through 20. So again, this is Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, like me, me here being Moses, from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet, like you, from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, and shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. And of course, this prophet that the Lord is speaking of, that he will raise from Israel's own people that will speak the word of the Lord is Christ Jesus. Amen. So we come now to our time of confession together. And like I always say, I do want us to treat this, uh, this, this time together honestly um, with some reflection, with some seriousness. Um, I spoke with a guy yesterday. We talked about how I think sometimes we underestimate or maybe devalue our need for a Savior. Because to truly understand why it is and how much we need a Savior means having to come to terms with just how sinful our natures truly are. And so we're going to come into this time of con confession before God and one another. And it'll be a little bit different. Usually we have our moment of silence before the prayer. This time there's going to be moments of silence within the prayer. Let us all now come together, together, and pray a prayer of confession. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this extraordinary world and its reminders of resilience, of grace, of hope, and life. For when grass shoots break through concrete, when the sun emerges after storms, for when people offer laughter in deep sadness, in these moments we see glimpses of who you are, and we are grateful. Yet if we reduce you to being like the cycle of nature or the best of humankind, we diminish your power to make the impossible real, to break apart the impenetrable evils of oppression, to cast out the very real fears that paralyze us, to banish the insidious demons of judgment and worthlessness. Forgive us, God, when we do not trust you to deal with the unspeakable awfulness in our lives and world. In the silence, we name the parts of our lives and our world that we believe are too broken to ever be made whole. Cast out our demons, Lord. Make us new again. 
Forgive us when we contribute to the brokenness of the world and the lives of people around us. In the silence, we name the things we have done that separate us from you and from others. Cast out our demons, Lord. Make us new again. Forgive us when we trust darkness more than we trust your light. In the silence, we name the things we think we need to keep hidden. Cast out our demons, Lord. Make us new again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Scripture says that those who are in Christ are a new creation. That everything old has passed away and for us to see that the new has come. Hear then, my friends, Christ's word of grace to us. That your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite you to join me as in one voice we make our statement of faith, we make our confession of faith by reciting those words that we know to be true, more than just mere words on a page, those things as contained in our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our sermon text this morning takes us to the Gospel of Mark, the first chapter, verses 21 through 28. Again, this is Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. They, Jesus and the disciples, went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, he, Jesus, entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once, his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. Friends, this is the word of God for you and I, the children of God. Thanks be to God. I grew up right across the street from my elementary school. We lived on a dead-end street that was on the back side of the school property. And so each morning I would walk to school and every afternoon I would walk back home from school. The whole trip took probably five minutes at the most, depending on where my classroom was. The whole time I was in elementary school from kindergarten through fifth grade, we had the exact same assistant principal. Now, I don't know exactly how tall he actually was, but at that age, he seemed to be at least seven, maybe even eight feet tall. He had broad shoulders, a good, I don't know, two, three, four feet across. He had a deep, booming voice. That wasn't it. 
That wasn't the worst part. In his office, hanging on the wall behind his desk chair, was a paddle, a big, broad, wooden paddle. And there were stories about that paddle, about the poor souls who found themselves on the wrong side of school rules and the punishment inflicted once he shut his office door and reached for that paddle. Now understand, neither I nor anybody that I knew had ever met with such punishment. None of us had firsthand knowledge of anybody else that may have met first met, met that kind of kind of punishment. We had no verifiable proof of that any such punishment actually took place, other than the fact that there was that paddle in his office. But we had all heard these stories, and we all didn't want to be part of any kind of punishment of that sort, so we all did our best to behave. In fact, I only had one run-in with him the entire time I was in school there, some six years. Each year in the springtime, our school would have an awards day assembly in the auditorium where all the kids who made uh, straight A's or had perfect attendance or got the presidential fitness medal, whatever it was, were all honored in front of their classmates and teachers. I guess I had somewhat of a reputation in regards to my writing, <clears throat> so I was asked to not just write, but also recite a poem in regards to awards day as part of the ceremony. And so I sat down and wrote what I thought was a pretty good poem, and I and another student had also been chosen to write and recite something. Both of us went to the auditorium for a practice one afternoon. I assumed it was going to be in front of some of our teachers, but instead it was just the two of us and the assistant principal. I was on stage, the other student was off stage. The assistant principal took a seat in the very back of the auditorium. And I found a little masking tape X that I was told to stand on. And with my poem in hand, I began to recite what I had written. I got through maybe the first line when I heard this voice come from the back of the auditorium louder. It scared the mess out of me. But I composed myself and I started again. I got about maybe two or three lines in when the same voice from the back of the auditorium, louder. It echoed through the auditorium. I felt my legs start to shake a little bit. I thought to myself, well, I could just run home. I live just across the street. But I didn't. And so I start again, and I'm trying to keep that lump that's starting to, to swell up in my throat down. I get about halfway through the poem, and again, louder! And so now, I'm sweating. And my voice is most certainly cracking. I feel a tear or two welling up in my eyes. And so I all but shout this poem out at the top of my lungs. And when I'm done, I'm shaking I'm breathing heavy. There's this silence. And then the voice says, Next! And I look over at my classmate who was standing there off stage. Her eyes were as big as saucers, her mouth wide open. And she couldn't move. She was paralyzed by fear. That was how he exercised his authority by striking fear into the hearts of the students. I dare say that many of you maybe have had similar experiences when someone else's authority has been exercised in such a way. Maybe you bristled under it. Maybe you thrived under it. All of us have stories about authority figures, don't we? And most times it's because we didn't like some aspect of it. But when you think about it, we submit to authority all the time. We submit to the authority of our employers because why? Well, we want to stay employed. We submit to the authority of the banks who have our mortgages or our, or our car loans because well, we want to keep a roof over our head. We want to keep our automobile. We submit to the authority of different laws and ordinances at the local and state and federal level because we believe that they keep us safe and keep the peace. Growing up, we would submit to the authority of our teachers because we wanted to learn. 
We submitted to the authority of our coaches because we wanted to get better at our sports and earn more playing time. Certainly those that have served or do serve in the armed forces know all about authority in regards to the chain of command. So I found it interesting this week that in our gospel lesson from Mark that there were two references to the authority of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Now when we talk about our walk with the Lord being one in which we submit our lives to the lordship of or the kingship of or the authority of Christ Jesus, I think we have a working knowledge of what that means. It means we're going to do our best to live the kind of lives that God wishes us to live. But it's so much more than that, my friend. It's so much more important than that. We submit to the worldly authorities because we typically get something out of it. A paycheck, a possession, some sense of security or peace, a, the achievement of some kind of a goal. And that's all well and good. But all that stuff is temporary. All that stuff will eventually fade away. But submitting to the authority of Christ Jesus gives us something that never fades and never ends, that being an eternity spent in peace with our Father in heaven. How? Well, through victory in our spiritual war with the devil and evil spirits. One of the great tragedies of our time, I feel, is the complete ignorance of spiritual warfare. Because educated people don't talk about Satan. Educated people don't talk about evil spirits. Educated people don't believe in ghost stories. All this talk about devils and spirits and evil and spiritual warf warfare, well, that's just for the ignorant masses who are afraid of the dark. But my friends, to ignore it, to pretend it doesn't exist, means that the devil has already won. But understand me that evil spirits unclean spirits, Satan, spiritual warfare, all of it exists. All of it is very real. The battle between the kingdom of Satan and the kingdom of God very much takes place in our lives, in our communities, and dare I say, in our sanctuaries. Jesus and his disciples are in Capernaum. And on the Sabbath day, they go to the synagogue for services. Jesus teaches, and we are told that those that heard him were astounded because he didn't teach like the scribes did, but he taught as one that had real authority. And I'll stop there for a moment. Rabbis at the time, depending on the synagogue, typically acted with some administrative authority. And so what happened is that when folks would gather on the Sabbath, the rabbis would pick folks to read scripture and do the teaching for that particular day's service. And given the relative low literacy rates of the ancient Near East at the time, typically the ones picked to read and then teach were the scribes. But the teaching was more along the lines of, well, Rabbi so-and-so would want us to know dot, dot, dot. Or, as you may remember, Rabbi so-and-so telling us dot, dot, dot. So when Jesus gets up, not only to read the Hebrew scriptures, but also to teach them, and he teaches them in his own voice, and not as some mouthpiece of another rabbi, well, those in the synagogue immediately took notice. I mean, after all, they are hearing the word from the word made flesh, are they not? Jesus is here teaching with the authority that can only come from the pleasure of God and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is completely different than some scribe simply quoting another rabbi. So right away, the congregation has taken notice. There's something going on here. They can all sense it and they can all feel it. And then Jesus is interrupted. It says, just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. Right there, in church. Not outside, not out on the street, not hanging out by the Jordan River. Right there, in church, sitting in the pews. 
probably a regular attender of the services there. And listen more closely to the language of the unclean spirit. The spirit confronts Jesus and says what? He says, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Notice that here the evil spirit is speaking in the plural. He says us. Now, Mark clearly tells us that the spirit is singular because he says a man with an unclean spirit. That's one. And also notice that Jesus rebukes the spirit and speaks to it in second person singular imperatives. And yet the evil spirit speaks in the plural. Why is that? Well, depending on the commentary you read, some say that this is a case where the Spirit is one of many, like the situation later on in this same gospel in chapter 5, verse 9. Or it could be that the Spirit is speaking of an entire realm of uncleanliness. Or it could be the Spirit is intentionally trying to deceive Jesus presenting itself as many when it is really just one. But here's what I wonder. I wonder if the speaker, or the spirit here rather, that is speaking is making a much bolder claim. Is it possible that the unclean spirit is claiming all the people in the synagogue as its own? I mean, this unclean spirit has already laid claim to this one man. And this same spirit is later able to make him go into convulsions. So is it possible that this spirit sees things a little differently than we do? Because, I mean, we look out and we see the synagogue and we see God's people there gathered in worship. The evil spirit, though... I think sees all the uncleanliness of those gathered for worship and lays claim to all that is unclean as its own. God's people have here gathered for worship while there is a war going on and in this war there are two sides, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. There is no middle ground. Either you are God's or you are Satan's. And the evil spirit looks out that entire synagogue and sees all the uncleanliness and says, these are mine. And yet when the spirit first appears in the story, Mark makes it sound like there is maybe some middle ground. Because it says, and immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. You catch that? In their synagogue. Not a synagogue that belongs to God. Not a synagogue that belongs to Satan. But one that belongs to the people of Capernaum. So the Spirit then makes its claim on them. Its claim is that all the people gathered there in worship are possessions of the unclean spirit and or Satan. Why? Because of their uncleanliness. They are unclean and can't possibly be in the presence of the most holy one of God. And because God won't have anything to do with those that are unclean, the Spirit cries out and reveals that the people of Capernaum, all gathered there in worship, because they are so unclean, are under the threat of being claimed by Satan. And so what are you going to do about it, Jesus? What are you going to do about it? Are you going to destroy everybody there sitting in the synagogue because of their uncleanliness? What are you going to do? And then Jesus reveals who he truly is. He's more than a man from Nazareth. He's more than a teacher with authority. He is the Christ. And this is his synagogue. These are his people. His rule is over all things, both visible and invisible. His power is a power without equal. He has come into the world not just to fight against Satan, but to defeat him. He will set free all the people 
that Satan claims as his own. I mean, that is Jesus' mission, after all, is it not? And the exorcism that Jesus performs on this man answers the unclean spirit's question in the affirmative that, yes, the Holy One of God has, in fact, come to destroy, to destroy the works of the evil one, to destroy the power that sin and death has on the lives of God's beloved children. Once freed from the power of sin, a child of God is then free to cooperate with the presence of God's grace and to hear his endearing voice. And friends, this scenario not only played out in Capernaum many years ago, but continues to play out today in our lives, our communities, our churches. Because whether we want to admit it or not, when we gather for worship, there are unclean spirits present. Each one of us has something in our lives that we need to recognize and repent of. Each one of us is susceptible to being claimed by Satan as his own, crafted by this lie that is whispered into our hearts and minds. God doesn't want anything to do with you. You know what you've done. You know what you've said. You know what you've thought. So does God. Do you really think that you are good enough? That you are clean enough to stand before God? It's too late for you. God doesn't want to have anything to do with you. Just keep on doing what you're doing. Sisters and brothers, don't believe it. Do not believe a word of it. When that whisper starts to make its way into your ears, stand on the authority of God. Proclaim the authority of Christ Jesus. Say, no, this, this is his church. And we are his people. His rule is over all things, both visible and invisible. His power is a power without equal. He has come into this world not just to fight against Satan, but to defeat Satan. And he will set free all the people that Satan claims as his own. How are the unclean made clean? How are the captives to sin and death set free? Solely by the gracious work of Jesus, bearing the curse of our uncleanliness on the cross, that he might rise and bring the blessing of God's holiness to us. For almost a year now, we have been experiencing the disruptive effects of COVID. And I think that one of the things that has happened is that it has changed how we view worship. We have begun to see why worship is truly a gift, whether it be in person or virtually. We've come to understand that we are Christ's church. The one we worship is the one that has come to rescue us from the power of Satan. And so, yes, friends, we live very much in the midst of a battle. Satan seeks to lay claim on all of our lives. But for us, my dear sisters and brothers, on our side fights the valiant one, our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. Christ who claims us as his own. And so when the devil tries to tempt you or to trip you up with any of his nonsense, remember that he is a coward. That he will most certainly flee when we say to him, I belong to Christ. I claim the authority of Christ on my life. And if you feel that he can't hear you, then in the words of my former assistant principal, may I offer to you this advice. Louder. By your words and your actions. Louder. By prayer and scripture and devotions. Louder. By meeting in small groups and coming to worship. 
louder, louder, louder. And he will most certainly flee. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <coughs> My friends, will you pray with me? Holy God, thank you for being stronger than the demons, doubts, and despair that trouble us. Thank you for bold prophets, faithful teachers, gentle caretakers, and ordinary saints who serve you by mentoring, guiding, healing, and challenging us. Give us grace to go and do likewise. Raise up in your church leaders to faithfully speak your word with boldness, clarity, and charity. Give its members hearts that listen with faith, obedience, and gladness. Give to those who have not heard or heeded your word ears to hear rightly, ponder patiently, and believe firmly. Give your persecuted disciples steadfastness, courage, and gentleness of heart to rightly confess Christ before their enemies. We ask your dearest blessings upon this congregation so that in all we say and do, we proclaim the strong saving love of Christ. Strengthen our families and make them into havens of safety, grace, and forgiveness. Have mercy upon all who are tormented by mental illness, post-traumatic stress, substance abuse, or anything else that clouds minds, distorts personalities, and shatters souls. Give them release from whatever has demonic control over their lives. Restore peace, sanity, relationships, and hope to them and to their loved ones. Drive out from this world the demons of hatred, violence, apathy, and injustice. Fill the hearts and minds of earthly leaders and the people entrusted to their care with your Holy Spirit. Give us all a passion for caring for our neighbors and grant us your peace. Grant healing, strength, comfort, and hope to all who are wounded in body, mind, or heart, especially those we name before you now, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. Shield them from every power of evil. Drive from them the demons of despair. Restore them to wholeness and to the company of all who love them. And fill them with the blessed peace of your Holy Spirit. Merciful Father, keep safe all who have died, trusting in you, and comfort those who mourn. Graciously hear and generously answer our prayers and petitions, dear Father, as may be best for us and to your greater glory. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the one who taught us all how to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Amen. Well, friends, now will be the time we would normally pass our offering plates throughout the sanctuary. Of course, we're not doing that just yet in this season of church life together, especially not today, as it is a virtual service. But it is in appreciation of your past giving and in anticipation of your future giving that I'd like to say a prayer now over our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings. Let us pray. God of power and wisdom, we give you our eternal thanks for the gift of your Son, who came not only to save us, but to teach us about your kingdom and how we might live, readying ourselves for that kingdom. He taught with authority, and if we listen, we will live a life of generosity, mercy, and compassion. 
Bless what we give this day and help us be faithful in the use of all of our resources that we might live like those anticipating your kingdom. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus Just from sin and self to cease Just from Jesus simply take Life and rest and joy and peace Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him How I prove Him more and more Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus Oh, for grace to trust Him more Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, own oh, for grace to trust him more. Own oh, for grace to trust him more.